Hello once again. Today we're going to be looking at something very exciting in this presentation today. Today we're going to be looking at WIEC practicals. For those of you uh, that are actually preparing for the upcoming WIEC, um, I think this um, clip will uh, really help you put yourselves together and um, help you attempt some of these questions. Okay, some of the questions, likely questions that you might encounter um, during this um, uh, um, exam. And um, in this particular presentation, we're going to be looking at um, each of the specimens that should be coming out um, in this um, biology practical exam. And um, we're also going to be looking at certain questions. I'm going to be telling you of some questions, likely questions that will actually pop up. And um, let's see, we'll also look at ways we can answer some of these questions. I, I, I would like you to actually pay attention to this particular presentation, and I believe you won't regret it. So, but before we actually begin this presentation, I would like us to look at some important tips that will actually help you in coordinating yourselves or actually um, preparing, not only just preparing, but also doing well. We can call them success tips for this WIEC practical as it relates to biology. And the first one we're going to be looking at in success tips, it is important that we should know, take note of materials that you will be using in your exam. Now, most times, most students, when they come into examination hall, they forget to come with pencil, they forget to come with the erasers and all these other um, minor materials. They are very essential. For biology practicals, you need your pencil, which must be a HB pencil. You must also come with an eraser. You must also come with a ruler for measuring the size of specimen or actually measuring um, the magnifications and so many other things you're going to use your rule for or your meter rule and um, for also giving a neat line when labeling and so on. I'm going to be mentioning most of these things as we go on. And also you're supposed to come with um, a razor blade for any kind of sectioning you might encounter in terms of the questions you'll be asked. You might be asked to do a section which has to do with probably a longitudinal section or uh, a transverse section. I'm also going to be explaining that in the course of this presentation, um, your school is expected to provide you with a forcep, you know, spatula, hand lens, petri dishes, test tubes, all these are materials that should be in place before you start your exam. Ensure that these materials are in place before you start your exam. Now, the second important tip to take note of is observation, in quote, observation. You know, most students don't actually observe specimen that is provided for them. Please always observe your specimen or the specimen that is provided for you very closely and very carefully. Ensure you observe it carefully. You know, you, you can even use your hand lens if necessary. Now, also another important thing you should take note is that in terms of observation, please don't draw what you have learned in textbooks. Don't draw what you have learned in textbooks. Most um, 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 examiners, they easily pick out some students that actually um, um, draw what they have learned in textbook without following what is given or provided for them as specimen. So please ensure that um, uh, you draw or you, you work with what was provided for you, what was provided for you. There are several questions where um, the examiners might say, uh, for instance, let's say a specimen of a cockroach was brought, for, brought to you or provided, and then um, you, the, 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 the question says, detach the wings of the cockroach and then draw. Now, most persons with the idea or the knowledge they have gotten from their textbooks, they've seen that in textbooks, the cockroach was drawn with wings. They go ahead drawing the cockroach with wings, okay? Or they might even ask the school teacher, the biology teacher, to provide a specimen, probably the cockroach, without wings, without wings. And please, I beg of you, try as much as possible to not draw or probably 100% depend on what you see as diagrams in your textbooks. Always work with what, was, what is provided to you or for you in your exam 
during your um, um, biology practical exam. Now, another thing again, I just want to actually talk about is diagrams. Diagrams. Now, you can't take away diagrams mostly from biology practicals. It's one of the major things that are always done in practicals. Okay, diagrams. Apart from running or putting up tests and uh, all that, which can also be an uh, example, is um, the food test and all the others. But most times, when specimen, mostly animals and plants, are actually provided for you as um, in during the, the examination you might be required to draw, you might be required to draw. Now, most students, they feel that um, so I'm good in drawing and um, I, I actually don't uh, need all these tips and all that. Please take note, for examiners, there are several important things they look out for during or in your drawing. One of them is that your drawing must have a title. Your drawing must have a title. Please ensure that your drawing has a title. Most persons, after drawing, they forget to write the title to that particular diagram or to that particular drawing. Please ensure that your drawing has a title. Now, to add added to that title should be a view. For instance, if we are having um, uh, a diagram of a tilapia fish, your, 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 your title should be Diagram of a Tilapia Fish. Now, if I am adding a view to it, I can say the diagram of the lateral view of a tilapia fish. Now, we have different types of view. Now, let me make use of this mouse as um, an example to show you the different views we have. Now, if I am looking at it on top here, looking at this on top in biology, the view is dorsal view. This is a dorsal view. If I'm drawing, looking at it on top, this is a dorsal view. If I'm drawing, looking at it on the side, by the sides, that is the lateral view. Now, if I'm also drawing from beneath, under, it is called what? Ventral view. This is the ventral view. And then if I'm drawing from behind, this is the posterior view. And then if I'm drawing from the front, this is the anterior view. I repeat it again. This is the dorsal view. This is the ventral view. This is the lateral view, the sides. They are the lateral view. Then we have the posterior view behind. And then we have the anterior view, which is in front. Please always ensure that when Whenever you're writing your titles or you are titling your diagrams or your drawings in biology exams, please, if need be, add a view to your drawings. Now, also in your title, if you are asked to do a section, now sectioning means simply means cutting. That's why I talked about having a razor blade. For instance, if I have a tomato fruit and I'm asked to do a longitudinal section of it. Now, longitudinal section is cutting it from the top to the bottom, okay? Making a longitudinal cut, okay? A vertical cut. That is what we call longitudinal cut. And then we also have the one we call transverse. Transverse cut section is a horizontal cut. And please, if they ask you to draw the longitudinal section of, let's say, okay, let's say transverse section of a tomato fruit, please, in your title, ensure you include the section. Ensure you include the section. You can say a diagram of the transverse view of tomato fruit transverse view or sorry transverse section of the tomato fruit a diagram of the transverse section of the tomato fruit also added to um, your title you can add magnification magnification please always ensure you add the magnification now, you, if you check some drawings in biology textbooks, probably in the practical textbooks, you will see after writing the title, you see some places where they put times 2 or times 0 0.5 or times half or times whatever. Now, that multiplication 2 talks about the magnification. Now, how do we calculate the magnification? It is simply means, it's simply image height over object height image height over object height. Now, what is the image? The image is what you have drawn. You measure the height of what you have drawn. The object height is the height of the specimen provided for you or to you, okay? Provided for you. The object height is the 
um, 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 height of the specimen provided and then the image height is the height of the specimen you have drawn in your book or you have drawn in the, in the paper that is provided for you okay so once you divide that whatever it gives to you it is multiplied that particular number you multiply it by that particular number that gives you your magnification very important please take note of this It's very important marks are awarded based on this marks are awarded based on this these are what examiners look out for another thing again the examiner looks out for in your diagram is the size most times you see in a particular question they will ask you draw a label diagram 8 cm to 10 cm of so so and so now if you are asked to draw ensure you follow the size specified and given to you follow these instructions they are actually very important in your marks they are important in whatever you score based on that particular diagram please follow it now when they say 8 cm to 10 cm it simply means your drawing should not be less than 8 cm and your drawing should not be more than 10 cm it should be within the confines of 8 and 10 cm now another thing again you see is clarity of lines your lines or the the diagram must have clear lines that's what it simply means your diagram should have clear lines the lines should be thin and be clearly visible not woolly not woolly should be clearly visible and thin not woolly hence i said you should be make use of a hb pencil make use of a hb pencil another thing again you should take note in terms of diagram is that avoid in every respect in any way you can please avoid shading avoid shading please avoid it don't shade if you shade you're losing your marks for that another thing again to take note of in terms of diagrams is neatness of lines neatness of lines now in terms of neatness of lines when you are actually labeling your diagram ensure that your label diagram the labeling that's the lines the labeled lines make sure you make that labeled lines using your ruler or using your rule make sure it is ruled don't use a free hand to do that make sure it is ruled properly okay and make sure it is all horizontal not vertical ensure it is not diagonal ensure that the lines don't cross they should be parallel and they should be all horizontal please note this all horizontal these are several um, 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 things that can boost your marks in diagrams okay so please um, let's take a look at some of the specimen that will be coming out in this biology practical 2022 sorry 2023 2024 um, section now let's take a look at the first one we have what we call mature fresh eggs of catfish that is specimen one uh, specimen a rather so mature frog of sorry mature fresh egg of catfish now that is how it looks like okay now what are some of the things you should be looking at under this particular specimen now first thing you should note is that catfish is a bony fish is a bony fish now as it relates to the eggs you might be asked what kind of reproduction it undergoes catfish undergoes oviparity that's the kind of reproduction it undergoes oviparity it simply means it, uh, it 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 reproduces or give rise to its young ones by laying eggs it lays eggs by laying of eggs so that those are the eggs you have just seen so it undergoes oviparity another thing again that might be asked as a question the, during the exam is the kind or the type of fertilization that the eggs of catfish undergo the type of fertilization please also note that catfish undergoes external fertilization it undergoes external fertilization it simply means that the eggs are fertilized externally 
they are fertilized externally. Also, you might want to be asked economic importance of this particular egg. One of the economic importance of catfish of the eggs of catfish is that they are good sources of proteins to animals. Good sources of what? Proteins to animals, both to humans and also to other animals. They are good sources of protein. Also, they can be used to generate revenue or income for the farmer, okay? For the one that is actually rearing um, these fishes in their fish farms. Now, also another important thing to take note of in um, the eggs of catfish is that the eggs of catfish they don't undergo parent they don't, they don't enjoy parental care they don't enjoy parental care so these are few of the things I, I think you should take note of with or take note of under this um, a mature fresh eggs of catfish another thing another specimen you should be looking at again is fresh eggs of domestic fowl fresh eggs of domestic fowl. Now they said it must be raw with the shells intact. Must be raw with the shell intact. Now note that the eggs of domestic fowl, they are called amnute egg. They are called amnute egg. Now they didn't say it should be boiled. If it were, they said it was to be boiled, we should be looking at diagrams because they might ask a longitudinal section and then you, for you to actually draw. Now, but also take note of this, please, I, I, I'm going to say something much later, but let's take this important fact about the eggs of domestic fowl. One of them is that the eggs of domestic fowl, they undergo, or domestic fowl, they undergo oviparity, just the same way we have for the mature fresh egg of the catfish. Also, they, um, in terms of domestic fowl, please take note, their eggs are fertilized not externally, but internally. Please note this. The eggs of uh, domestic fowls are fertilized internally. And also another thing again about the eggs of domestic fowl is that these eggs are incubated before, be before being hatched into new young individuals. Before being hatched into new individuals, okay? They must be incubated. And one of the ways the domestic uh, fowl incubates her egg is by sitting on it to ensure warmth for it. Also, please take note that the eggs of a domestic fowl, they enjoy parental care. Now, compare specimen A and specimen B. Now, I am actually suspecting and believing that questions will be asked based on differences. Differences between specimen A and differences between specimen B, and also similarities between specimen A and B. Now, let's take a look at some of the similarities between specimen A and specimen B. Now, one of the similarities is that both eggs, they are produced through um, the kind of reproduction that is found in both eggs is what? Oviparity. They are oviparous eggs oviparous eggs. These are eggs that are laid and then they grow out to become uh, or they, they, they actually deliver um, young new individuals. Now the next one is that both eggs are fertilized or the fertilized eggs develop into new individuals. That's another important similarities. And then number three important similarities is that both eggs are good sources of protein. They are good sources of protein. So here we go, three important similarities between specimen A and then specimen B. Number one, we said that both produce through, they both are produced through oviparity. Number two is that those eggs are fe those fertilized eggs, they develop into new individuals. And then number three, both eggs are good sources of proteins. Now let's take a look at differences differences between these eggs or between specimen A as well as specimen B. Now, differences in specimen A. The eggs in specimen A do not have shell. That is the mature uh, fresh egg of a catfish do not have shell, while specimen B, the eggs have shell. Number two difference between specimen A and specimen B is that specimen A, their eggs are fertilized externally. The eggs of specimen A are fertilized externally, and then the eggs of specimen B, they are fertilized internally. So we have external fertilization in A, 
and internal fertilization in B. Number three is that the eggs of specimen A are not incubated before they are being hatched into new individuals, but in specimen B, the eggs are incubated before they are being hatched into new individuals. And then number four is that the eggs in specimen A, they do not enjoy parental care. Immediately the eggs are fertilized, the both parents or both parents go their separate ways, leaving the eggs to their own fate. Okay, that's why most of them are being eaten by all by uh, by many um, other animals, mostly aquatic animals, and so on. So they do not enjoy parental care. But specimen B, which is the egg of a domestic fowl, they enjoy parental care. And then number five. Numerous eggs are being produced in specimen A, so much. When they lay their eggs, as you can see, if you go back to um, the diagram of specimen A, you will see that numerous eggs are laid by specimen, by a catfish. But few eggs are being laid by domestic fowl. Now, please take note, these are likely questions that will come up in this particular biology practical. So, and that's the answer to differences as well as similarities between specimen A and specimen B. Now, specimen C is the picture of the uterus containing a fetus. Picture of the uterus, another name for the uterus is the womb containing a fetus. Now, uh, the most important thing you should be looking out for as it, it relates to this practical is that the uterus is actually attached is attached, or sorry, the fetus rather, is attached to the uterus through a disc-like structure which is called the placenta. So the placenta is one of the, the most, one of the important parts uh, that ensures the connection between the fetus to the uterus. Also, another thing you should take note of is the process by which the embryo, when it, or sorry, the egg, when it is fertilized and turns into an embryo, the process by which this egg or fertilized egg or embryo is attached to the, to the walls of the uterus. Now, after fertilization, that process is called implantation. So please take note of that. They might ask you, based on that, what is implantation? Please note that implantation is actually the process by which the embryo is attached to the walls of the uterus after fertilization. Now also note that one of the major functions of the uterus is to help to accommodate the fetus till it is what delivered, to the till delivery date or till delivery or birth. Okay, it helps to accommodate the fetus. And as the fetus or the embryo is actually developing, the uterus also enlarges to accommodate it. It enlarges to accommodate it. Okay, now remember we talked about the placenta. Please take note, I, I, I probably suspect that um, questions on the functions of the placenta may be asked. Functions of the placenta. Now let's take a look at just briefly four functions of the placenta. Number one, the placenta prevents the mixing of the maternal blood to, uh, with the fetal blood. That is the blood of the baby, of the fetus, it doesn't mix. They don't mix. They don't mix with that of the mother. They don't mix. And what helps to prevent it from mixing is the placenta. Also, one of the, another major function of the placenta is that the placenta absorbs digested food from the mother's blood and sends it to the fetus fetal blood through a process we call what? Diffusion. So the mother feeds the baby through the placenta. Another um, function of the placenta is that it exchanges cars, uh, um, um, CO2, which is carbon four oxide, from the future blood and for oxygen from the maternal blood. So the, 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 the fetus, which is the baby that is in the womb, exchanges gases through the placenta. Exchange of gases or gaseous exchange takes place through the placenta. And then finally, number four is that the placenta helps in the removal of excretory waste, mostly nitrogenous waste, from the future blood to the maternal blood and to the kidney of the mother or the maternal kidney. So these are some of the functions of the 
placenta. Please take note of it. It might come out. Please, when you do, know how to answer correctly. Now, the next one is um, longitudinal section of the ovary of pride of Barbados. Longitudinal section of the ovary of pride of Barbados. Now, if you look at the structure of pride of Barbados, it has a petal, it has a sepal, it also has its um, um, uh, 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 androsium, which is the male part of the flower, and the male part of the flower consists of the filament and also of the anther. Now, the female part of the flower consists of which is called the gynosium it consists of the stigma which is at the top and consists of the style which is a long slender uh, um, tube-like structure and it leads to the ovary and the ovary contains the ovules in fact the ovary contains like i said it contains the ovules so if you are actually um, doing a longitudinal section remember i told you longitudinal section is cutting it vertically so you should get a um <clears throat> the flower of pride of barbados and ensure you do a longitudinal section carefully using a razor blade you cut it and revealing the ovary revealing the ovary as well as the ovals inside of the ovary so that is how to do it and i suspect greatly that questions will be asked on these based on diagrams so please learn the diagram of the ovary of the pride of Barbados. You can see what we have here, which is a longitudinal section of a flower, which is the pride of Barbados, revealing the ovary. I'm not saying you should draw every other thing, but when drawing, ensure that your labeling should include, should be proper on the gynosium which you can actually label the stigma, you can actually label the style, but very well label the ovary and the ovals. Very important to note, to note it, okay? Very important. So please take note of diagram. And remember the tips I gave to you about diagram, your, your title, your size, clarity of lines, neatness of lines, your labels. Please go back again. You are going to hear me saying about these things over and over again. Please just go through it and ensure your drawings are perfect and okay. Now there are also some important things to take note of about Pride of Barbados, about Pride of Barbados. One of the things to take note of about Pride of Barbados is that the fruits of Pride of Barbados is a dry dehiscent fruit, but a legume okay so the type of fruit is a legume and all legumes uh, are what dry dehiscent they are all dry dehiscent and also the dispersion dispersion method of of pride of barbados mostly of the seed is explosive mechanism so the way the the, the method through which the seeds of pride of barbados are being dispersed is explosive mechanism now now another specimen is the leaf of pride of barbados the leaf of pride of barbados now if you look at the structure of that leaf we have different variations of leaf in biology different variation of leaf now we have actually two variations of leaf we have the simple leaf and then we have the compound leaf now a simple leaf is actually a leaf with unbroken lamina <clears throat> Now, the lamina is the, the, the surface, which you can call the leaflets, okay? The lamina is just flat and surface, okay? They don't have broken, uh, they have unbroken lamina. They don't have broken lamina. Now, an example of, of, of a leaf that has simple leaf is guinea grass, guinea grass. The second one is compound leaf. Now, compound leaf, the, the lamina is broken and it separates into what we call leaflets. Now, we have different types of compound leaf, probably two. Now, these two types of compound leaf, one of them is called the palmate leaf. And the palmate leaf is seen in cassava leaf. I believe you've seen the cassava plant. The, the, the leaves are like fingers, okay? They are like the palm, okay? You see it as this. So that uh, type of leaf is called the palmate leaf. Another um, uh, type of um, compound leaf is called the pinnate 
We have the palmate leaf, we have the pinnate leaf. Now, the pinnate leaf is just the perfect example. The perfect example of a pinnate leaf is the leaf of pride of Barbados. The leaf of pride of Barbados, okay? That is an example of a pinnate leaf. The leaf of pride of Barbados, all right? So that's an example of a pinnate leaf. Now, another thing, again, you should take note of is um, that the next specimen, which is specimen F. Now, specimen F is guinea grass. Guinea grass. But we're not looking at the leaf per se. We're looking at the whole plant. Now, guinea grass, there are several things you should take note about guinea grass. One of the important things to look out for guinea grass is that the botanical name of guinea grass is Panicum maxicum. Panicum maxicum. That is the botanical name of guinea grass. Now, guinea grass is a perennial plant. That is when you're looking at the life cycle, we're looking at the whole plant in general. So it, it's a, a perennial plant. Another thing, again, that is very important about guinea grass is that it serves as food, mostly carbohydrates, for some animals, mostly the herbivores. Okay? So it serves as food for some animals, mostly ruminant animals animals and another important thing mostly i can call this an economic importance the last two i'm giving we can use that as economic importance of guinea grass the second economic importance of guinea grass is that it is a weed it is a weed to crops and it can be controlled by chemical and cultural method. Of course, chemical method has to do with the use of chemicals. And then cultural method has to do with um, farming practices like weeding, okay, weeding. So it can be controlled through um, by chemical and cultural methods. Also, if I should add another economic importance, that's number three economic importance of guinea grass, is that guinea grass, um, brings about competition or it competes with flowering plants or crops for space, nutrients, and water, all right? And, and, and most times it out-competes these crops because they are fast growing, fast growing. So they deprive crops of food, they deprive crops of, shell, of, of, of nutrients, they also deprive crops of space. So it can also, number four, it can lead to poor yield in crop. Poor yield in crop. So I've given you four important um, 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 economic importance of guinea grass. Now looking at specimen F, which is guinea grass, it also has a leaf. Please take note of the leaf of guinea grass. Compare it with the leaf of Pride of Barbados. Remember, if you take your mind back when I discussed Pride of Barbados, I said that Pride of Barbados is an example of a pinnate leaf, which is an example, which is a type of compound leaf. But the guinea grass is an example of a simple leaf. An example of a simple leaf. Now, guinea grass is a monocotyledonous plant. Guinea grass is a monocotyledonous plant, while uh, uh, um, Pride of Barbados can be referred to as a dicotyledonous plant because it is a legume. Because it is a legume. Also, if you compare the leaves of guinea grass and that of Pride of Barbados, you will discover that guinea grass has parallel venation in its leaflets, and then uh, in terms of um, Pride of Barbados, it has net venation. Guinea grass, parallel venation, um, Pride of Barbados leaf, net venation. So these are some of the differences. Please take note of differences in quote. It might be asked, differences between specimen E and then specimen F. Now, the next one is um, specimen G. Now, specimen G is cocoyam plant. Now, you are expected or you will be provided with the whole plant, cocoyam plant, the whole plant. Now, the whole plant includes the leaf, it includes the stem, it includes the comb, it also includes the root. So, the whole plant, we are looking at it, all right? Also, there can be a comparison between um, the, 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 the guinea grass and the leaf of the cocoyam. Okay, the leaf of cocoyam. Comparison can be done there. Differences can be struck out 
based on the two of them. Now, if you look at the leaf of um, cocoa yam, the leaf is a perfect example of a compound leaf, a compound leaf. And that of a guinea grass is what a simple leaf. You can also see the net venation in the compound uh, in cocoa yam leaf, and um, but you can also see the net uh, parallel venation in that of what um, uh, what they call it the grass uh, guinea grass. And also, if you compare the two of them, um, cocoa yam is actually in terms of similarities. Cocoa yam is a perennial crop, and then also guinea grass is also a perennial crop. Another major difference between cocoa yam the cocoyam plant and the guinea grass plant is that the cocoyam plant is actually a dicotyledonous plant and then the guinea grass is actually a monocotyledonous plant okay so also take note of differences between specimen f and then specimen g now specimen h is the com c-o-r-m of cocoyam the com of cocoyam now i also want to predict this Please take note of the diagram of the com of cocoa Take note of the diagram of the com of cocoa I believe most of you have seen, uh, every one of us have seen cocoa before. But please take note of the com of cocoa Please also note that cocoa is an underground stem. Is an underground stem. Now, um, a com is modified swollen. Is a modified swollen stem which accumulates large food reserve. I repeat, it is a com is a modified swollen stem which accumulates large food reserves. And their leaves are also being reduced to protect uh, to protective what scales. Now the com of cocoyam is an example of a modified underground stem, a form of natural vegetative reproduction. Natural vegetative reproduction. So it is not artificial. When we're talking about artificial vegetative reproduction, we're looking at things like layering, we're talking about macotting, we're talking about grafting, and so on. Okay. But when we are talking about natural vegetation, we're looking at things like um, 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 the calm, we're talking about suckers, we're talking about runners, we're talking about bulb, we're talking about rhizomes. Okay. So all these are modified underground stem. And every modified on the ground stem is an example of natural vegetative reproduction. So please take note that the com, or in fact cocoyam, undergoes natural vegetative what? reproduction. And the com of um, cocoyam is a modified underground stem. All right? It's an example of a modified underground stem. Now, specimen J is dry humus dry humus now um uh, normally it's supposed to be in a beaker but um looking at a dry humus in a beaker now when do, why do we call it a dry humus now dry humus in the sense that it 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 does not contain soil water okay all the soil water has been evaporated now it has its own consequences all right. Now, when the soil water is being evaporated, it poses a big problem to plants or crops that are actually growing in that particular soil. Soil water is essential. Is essential. Dry humus does not have soil water, which and the, one of the importance of soil water is that this soil water helps these plants to manufacture their own food. And of course, that process is called photosynthesis. Plants can manufacture food in the presence of water. And that's what photosynthesis is all about. The, the, the process by which green plants manufacture their food in the presence of carbon dioxide, water, and as well as what? Sunlight. So water is one of the essential factors or materials needed for photosynthesis to actually take place. So if you see a plant growing on dry humus, that plant doesn't grow well. It ends up dying because it can't manufacture food and it can't feed or obtain nutrients from it. Now, also, another importance of soil water, another importance of soil water is that this soil water is required for essential minerals or elements to dissolve in. So it serves as a solute where most of these essential minerals dissolve. So plants can absorb them through the process of what? Osmosis. Plants can absorb them through the process of 
osmosis. Also, if the soil water is not there, it poses a big problem to soil organisms that are found inside the water. If there is no soil water in dry humus, it's going to, going to be so hazardous. It, it becomes lethal to most um, soil organisms. Example is um, earthworm. And one of the major functions of the earthworm is to burrow hole as to create airspace for the plants. So it, soil water is so needful, so needful. Of course, we know that dry humus or humus is dead remains of plants and animals, which is high, very high in soil nutrients, which is very high in nutrients. But these nutrients cannot be taken in, in by the plants and cannot be uh, uh, taken into the plants if soil water is lacking. So dry humus does not support, um, it's, in fact, it supports little or no vegetation or scanty vegetation. Supports little or scanty vegetation, no vegetation at all. Now, the next one is specimen K, which is moist humus. Moist humus. Now, when you touch moist humus, you feel the wetness in it, okay? It means it contains soil water. Moist humus contains soil water. And moist humus enables plant to yield or grow well. Also, the water in the soil is essential for seed germination. So when I plant my seed inside a dry humus, I should, shouldn't be expecting it to grow. But when I plant it in a moist humus, definitely the seed will germinate. The seed will what? Germinate. It absorbs this water and then splits its tester. So it absorbs water, it absorbs water to ensure germination of seed. So those are some of the importance of um, um, dry humus as, long, as well as um, wet or moist humus, okay? Now let's move to the next thing which is specimen L. Now specimen L is ripe orange fruit ripe orange fruit. I believe everyone knows I've seen a ripe orange fruit before. Now the reason for bringing out a section of the fruit in this presentation is because I believe and I'm suspecting that questions on um, the transverse section, drawing the transverse section of a ripe orange fruit will be asked, will be asked. So please take note of the transverse section of ripe orange fruit. Take note of it. It's very important. Likely questions, uh, is a likely question that might come out this year, biology practical. Now, but before we continue with this, please take note that orange fruit is a berry fruit. That means the type of fruit for orange is berry. So orange fruit is a berry fruit. The placentation of orange fruit is axial. Now, what is placentation is actually the arrangement of the ovules, ovules within the ovary of a plant, of a flower. Arrangement of the ovules within the ovary of a plant. So, in terms of um, mango, they have axial placentation. We have different types of placentation. We have marginal, we have um, um, uh, parental, we have axial, we have basal, and so on. These are different types of placentation, but in terms of orange, it is axial. Now, the method of dispersion for orange fruit is animals. Animals. So that is the method through which the seeds and the, and the fruit actually is also dispersed. Now, take note of specimen M. Please hold your mind on specimen N. I'm still going to come back to it okay, or O or rather, or whatever it is. I'm going to come back to it. That's the ripe orange fruit. We're going to come back to it. Now, look at this one. They said longitudinal section of coconut fruits. Also, I am um, 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 imagining that they will also ask questions on the diagram of the coconut fruit. Since they have already asked for a longitudinal section, please prepare yourselves very well for the longitudinal section of a coconut fruit. It is very quite, it's so quite easy to draw. Now, after drawing the whole thing, the, you, all you should be labeling is the epicarp, the fibrous mesocarp, the hard endocarp, and then we have the embryo which is found inside. 
or sorry, the seed, and then we have the embryo. That's a very simple diagram. So please take note of the diagram and remember those things, uh, success tips or those um, things I told you concerning that when, when drawing and labeling any uh, specimen. Please take note of it. Now, one thing I also believe they usually ask, in fact, it has been a common uh, trend in Wayek and Neko, they keep asking, anytime you see um, a, 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 a two different fruits coming out, they usually ask similarities, they usually ask differences between these fruits. Okay, now, but before I go into that, please take note of the type of fruit that coconut fruit belongs to. Coconut fruit is a droop a droop and its method of dispersion is water like i said also that you might be asked differences now let's take a look at structural differences between specimen l and specimen m structural differences between specimen l and specimen n now specimen l of course is the ripe orange fruit and then specimen m is coconut fruit okay lot to no section of coconut fruit now what are their differences please take note specimen l the seeds are small the seeds are small in specimen l but in specimen m the seeds are large number two difference is that the endocarp the endocarp of specimen l or orange fruit is soft while the endocarp of specimen M is hard. That's the hard part of the coconut shell, of the coconut that you break. That's the endocarp. Number three difference is that in specimen L, many seeds are produced. Okay, It possesses or have many seeds. But in specimen M, it is only one seed. It's made up of just one seed. So coconut is made up of just one seed, but orange fruits are made up of many seeds and then finally number four is that the mesocarp of specimen l which is orange fruits is succulent and fleshy succulent and fleshy but the mesocarp is in in in, in coconut is not succulent it's not fleshy it is rather fibrous it is not succulent it is not fleshy it is what fibrous so these are three or sorry four structural differences between specimen L and specimen M, all right? And then finally for this YEC practical is specimen N. Specimen N is actually longitudinal section of fresh chili pepper fruit. Longitudinal section of fresh chili pepper fruit. So that is it on the screen. Also, please take note of the diagram. Please take note of the diagram. It might also be asked. Ensure you follow the tips I gave concerning drawing a labeled diagram. Now, these are some of the important facts about the fresh chili pepper fruit. Now, the type of fruit, <clears throat> it is a berry. Just like um, the tomato fruits. Sorry, the yes, tomato fruit is also a berry. Um, chili pepper fruit is also a berry. Orange is also a berry. Placentation for chili pepper fruits is axial. Also, in terms of um, um, orange, it is also axial. And then the method of dispersion is animals, especially birds, mostly birds. Birds bring about um, dispersion of the seeds or the fruits of um, fresh chili pepper fruits. Okay? So this is where we call it a wrap-up on this YEC practicals. Please, I hope I have actually helped out and helping you revise for your biology practical. Please follow those success tips, and I see you doing well. Till we'll meet again next time. Bye for now.